In this video, we're going to address some of the course competencies that were not covered in the other videos. So first, we're going to talk about the four different types of neurons. There are four different types of neurons, and we're going to talk about each type in more detail on the following slides. So there are unipolar neurons, bipolar neurons, multipolar neurons, and pseudo-unipolar neurons. Unipolar neurons are only associated with insects, and they are involved in stimulating muscles or glands in the insects. They have the cell body here, otherwise known as the soma. And they have a single axon extending from the soma. There are no dendrites up on the other side, so no dendrites here. And then there are these axon terminals. Bipolar neurons have a soma or cell body with a single dendrite and a single axon extending from the cell body. An example of a bipolar neuron is a cell or a neuron in the retina. And so the retina is the sensory structure in the eye. So there are these other neurons called, called photoreceptors that change when light energy hits them. So light energy actually causes an action potential in the photoreceptors. And then those photoreceptors synapse with these bipolar neurons to pass the information to other neurons so that the signal can ultimately reach the brain. Multipolar neurons are the most common, and these are the ones that we primarily talked about in the other videos. You can see that there is a soma or the cell body, multiple dendrites, so all of these cellular extensions here are dendrites, and then a single axon with the multiple axon terminals. And the pseudo-unipolar neuron has characteristics similar to a unipolar neuron and a bipolar neuron. So we have the soma here. And then there's one cellular extension. But then it branches into two separate extensions. And many sensory neurons have this structure to them. Now we're going to talk about the difference between chemical and electrical synapses. So in a, a different video, we talked about the chemical synapses. And remember with chemical synapses, you have an axon terminal releases a neurotransmitter. That crosses the synaptic cleft and binds to a receptor in the dendrite of the postsynaptic neuron. Now, electrical synapses do not have neurotransmitters involved, and they do not have a gap between neurons, and they, the neurotransmitters, since there aren't any, there are no receptors for the neurotransmitters to bind to. So first of all, electrical synapses are less common than chemical synapses. 
but they all but they are found in all nervous systems. So all animals that have some sort of nervous tissue is going to have both chemical synapses and electrical synapses. And the primary difference is that the presynaptic and postsynaptic membranes of the neurons are connected by gap junctions. And on, a, on the next slide, I'll kind of draw this out to give you a better idea of what I mean by these gap junctions. So what happens is that the presynaptic neuron gets an action potential. So it has that current or that voltage change moving through it. And then instead of triggering the release of a neurotransmitter at the axon terminal, instead that depolarization just travels through the gap junctions into the postsynaptic neuron. So one kind of benefit of electrical synapses is that they're actually faster than chemical synapses because there's, I mean, chemical synapses are still very, very quick, but there is a little bit of a delay between the release of the neurotransmitter that then has to bind to a receptor, and then that receptor has to open a channel to allow different ions to cross the membrane. But with electrical synapses, that depolarization moves directly into the next neuron without having to deal with the events of the chemical synapse. Electrical synapses are also more reliable, so they're less likely to get blocked by things like uh, chemicals or drugs or medications or um, you know, toxins or something like that in the environment. All right, so let's first review what a chemical synapse looks like. All right, so we're going to draw a multipolar neuron here. And so pretend like these are the dendrites. And this is the soma or the cell body. And then we have an axon. And I'm just going to give it two axon terminals. And then we have another neuron that it's communicating with. Over here. So in a chemical synapse, remember that you have these neurotransmitters in the axon terminal. And they have to be released into the synaptic cleft to then bind to receptors in the dendrites of the receiving neuron. So this would be called the presynaptic neuron because it is before this synapse. And this would be the postsynaptic. And this area here is the synaptic cleft. Now, if we were to look at an electrical synapse, so once again, we have this neuron here, and I'm just going to kind of draw one kind of axon terminal here. And I'm actually going to draw it kind of big. I'm going to make it kind of exaggerated to make it a little bit easier to see what's happening. And then let's say that it is up against the cell body of another neuron here. And notice I didn't leave any space between the presynaptic neuron and the postsynaptic. And that's because these two cell membranes are touching. And there are gap junctions, which are these channels that are actually connecting these, uh, these membranes. All right, so I'm drawing some little green channels in there. 
And so what this means is that as the current is moving down the axon into the axon terminal, instead of triggering the release of neurotransmitters, instead that depolarization just travels through those gap junctions directly into the next neuron. So to give you maybe a better visual of these gap junctions, because I know it's a little bit small here, let's imagine that we have two cells that are touching each other. And so their cell membranes are up against each other. And then they have these little protein channels that are bridging the gap. And so whatever is happening in this cell can easily be shared with this cell. All right, so these gap junctions connect the cytoplasm of adjacent cells. So I like to think of this as if you've ever stayed in a hotel that has adjoining rooms, you know that sometimes there's a door between the two rooms so you can get from one room to the other without going out into the hallway. And that's kind of like what's happening here. So instead of these molecules or whatever having to go out of the cell and then back in, it can just be shared directly from one cell into the other and it's much quicker. On the next couple slides, we're going to talk about long-term potentiation and long-term depression. And this depression is not the mental illness depression. This refers to depression of the connections between neurons. So long-term potentiation is just the strengthening of a synaptic connection. So basically, the more firing or the more action potentials that occur and the more communication between one neuron and the other, the more likely that synapse is going to be strengthened and stay together. And there's this kind of saying that neurons that fire together wire together. And so as this potentiation kind of builds up, this communication becomes stronger and faster. Long-term depression is the opposite of long-term potentiation. Remember, we're not talking about the mental illness of depression here. All right, so that's not the kind of depression we're talking about. We're just talking about a essentially neurons that don't communicate very often with each other. So essentially, the neuron connections that aren't being used, so essentially a neuron that's not really communicating with another neuron, eventually that synaptic connection gets weaker over time. Now, both of these are important. So you might think that long-term depression of a, or this weakening of the synaptic connection might be a bad thing. But in reality, you need to be able to strengthen the neurons you use and ignore the neurons you don't. If you didn't have that ability to basically focus on the, the, the stronger neuron connections, you wouldn't have enough resources to support them all. So it's important if you think about learning, you're more likely to you know, learn and remember the things that strengthen those synaptic connections. And then the stuff that you don't use, that kind of goes away. So it's kind of like that. You can even think of things like muscle memory, where you learn how to do something so, for example, I used to play violin back in elementary school, middle school, a little bit in high school, um, but I have not touched a violin in 20 plus years. If you were to hand me a violin tomorrow, I would not be able to play it. So those neurons have been depressed. I haven't used that skill in so long that I, my, my brain has just forgotten those connections.